Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Salvation for saved sinners. Okay, this is going to be part two, the deceitfulness of riches. Turn to 2 Timothy 3.16. So this stuff, might you might say, well, you already went over this in part one. I'm going to go over this in every part until I hammer it home. Okay, until people understand what God has showed me and I'm trying to show you guys through the Word of God. Okay. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. God has given us this book for that purpose, so we can live for Jesus Christ and keep our eyes on Jesus Christ with the life that we live. Okay. Turn to Philippians 2.17. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. I always like to point out the thing about being a Christian, Bible-believing, God-fearing man that I've learned in my life is you tend to really live for the Lord when other people are watching. It's the times you don't think someone's watching that the temptation comes in and you give in to sin, and you choose to sin, and but nobody was watching, okay? The motivation still needs to be there even though no one's watching. The motivation of the Lord. What's that motivation? The fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of all wisdom. But not just in the absence. There's a lot of times in these last days, brethren, that we're going to be separated and isolated. And you need to be doing what's right even though the brethren aren't watching. They're not physically there watching. Okay? Not much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's the fear there. What's the motivation? Fear. You're supposed to be fearing God. Jesus is there. He's with you 24-7. Anything you do, if you're saved and born again. Okay? We talked about an intro for the three salvations. I believe there's three salvations in this world today. Okay? Three types of salvations. One is for, for lost people. Two are for only saved. Okay? And if you followed along, then you understand what I'm saying, but I'll go over it again real quick. Okay? You've got salvation, it's eternal salvation. Okay? That's what happens at salvation, at, uh, we call it at salvation. That salvation belongs to God. It's not your own. The Bible doesn't contradict. You say, what we just read there, it said, work out your own salvation. It's your salvation. Your own. Hear me out. Salvation for lost world. That brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I went through is eternal salvation. It's salvation from hell, so we can go to heaven and be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay? That's the first salvation, and it's for lost people. Okay, it's out there for lost people. You and I have been through that. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, ask God to save you. And when God saves you, that's where this salvation right here that's talking about here comes into play. When God saves you, the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Not some, not just a little bit. All things have become new. Now God, we did that study. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Talking about the resurrection. People who don't have a changed life. Paul accuses them in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he accuses them of denying the resurrection with the life that they're living. They have this head knowledge, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but their life isn't reflecting it. What's going on here? They're that's the second salvation. The moment you get saved to the moment you die or get caught up, that's the second salvation. That's the salvation this is talking about. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? And if you read that passage, because I'm just, we went over in the first, uh, the, either the intro or part one, I can't remember. But um, it talks about before in that whole passage, it's talked about how everybody has to answer to Jesus Christ. That's why it says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Turn to Romans 14, 11. Salvation in this life as a Christian what, how you live your life as a Christian, you're going to have to answer to Jesus Christ for the judgment seat of Christ. And real quick, the third salvation, which we'll eventually get into, is salvation from this life. Salvation from this wicked world. It's either going to be at your death, 
But more importantly, the, we're still not fully redeemed until the catching away of the body of Christ. That's why it says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which will remain shall be caught up. Well, okay. So they are not fully redeemed either until the catching away of the body of Christ. So that third salvation is at the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Just wanted to throw that in there real quick. But right now we're talking about the second salvation that there is for today. And that's salvation in the life of a Christian. Are you living a life of Christ? Whatever you do, you're going to have to answer. I'm going to have to answer for a lot of things in my life. The good and the bad. Once again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Okay, the whole world as a whole is going to have to answer to Jesus Christ. But I want to point out that this is Paul speaking, and he says, us. So then every one of us, who's the us there, saved sinners. Every one of us is going to have to give an account to himself before Jesus Christ. Before God, which Jesus Christ is God. He's not God the Son. He's not the third person, or the second person of the Trinity. Okay, he's God Almighty. There's only one, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, there's only but one God, the Father. Time again in the Bible, say God the Father, God the Father. There is no God the Son, there is no God the Holy Spirit. There's just the Son of God the Father. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but he's the body. Whole nother study, but I just want to put that when it says account of himself to God, it says to God, capital G God is a reference to the Father, yet it talks about how uh, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.10, how it talks about how we're going to answer to Jesus Christ, though. But it said we're going to answer to God, the Father. You say you're adding the word, the Father. The Bible clearly says there's only one capital G, God. It's the Father. To deny that, you deny Scripture. If you deny Jesus is not, if you say Jesus isn't the Father, you deny that he's, His Godhood. Okay, that's why you have the Godhead. Not Trinity, Godhead. But 2 Corinthians, it says 5.10, For we must all appear, appear before the judgment seat of God the Father. No, it says Christ. Jesus Christ. That everyone may receive the thing done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That's why I was getting ahead of myself a little bit. Good or bad, everything I've done in my life as a Christian. Before I was saved, the, you consider the whole... It got wiped, the slate got wiped clean, as they say, that whole saying, the slate got wiped clean. From that point on, once I got saved and born again, that's when God started holding me accountable for my life as a Christian. Now, the sins I commit in my life as a Christian, it's not going to send me to hell. Remember, that's the first salvation, eternal salvation. I'm sealed, and you are too, brothers and sisters of Christ, if you're saved, you're sealed into the day of redemption. Okay? No sin is going to send you to hell. But you still have to answer for your life as a Christian to Jesus Christ. That's almost another one for the Godhead. Another one million, that was one billion, two points for the Godhead. Zero points for the Trinity. Okay. It says, account of himself to God, and here we read that we have to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This, the account of himself to God is us, Christians, saved sinners, you still have to answer to, your, to God, but no, no, you answer to Christ. They're one and the same. Jesus Christ is God the Father. He's God fully and completely. But you have to answer to Jesus Christ, and that's what this study is for, is to open the eyes of the brethren, to get them back on Jesus Christ, to make sure you're walking that walk with the Lord, despite all the nonsense and the craziness that's going out in the world. Going on out in the world. The first part of the study was... Uh, Cares of this world. Today we're going to be talking about deceitfulness of riches. But I want to go over this again to say, hey, this is why it's so important. Okay? This is the third series of the second salvation. And we'll get to the third. But the second salvation is salvation in this life. How are you living for Jesus Christ today? What gets in the way of your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and can totally destroy your life and make this 100% unfruitful? Cares of this world was one. We're going to be getting to deceitful as the riches. But I want to point out, when you stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, what you receive and what you lose, it was all on you. 
Well, you can't blame God. You can't blame the brothers and sisters in Christ. You can't blame the lost world. Oh, it's just wicked sin. I mean, we're all, like I said, we're only two-thirds redeemed. This body is not redeemed. That's why Paul talked about, in, um, I think it's Romans, yeah, Romans 8, I think it was, 7 or 8, where he talks about how with the, the mind, he may serve the law of God, because he's spiritually minded, walking after the spirit. But with the, with the flesh, the law of sin. This body is still wicked and sinful, okay? Every time I sin, I take responsibility. You're supposed to. There's times where I try to defend it a little bit or make some excuses for it. But in the end, I come to the Lord broken and say, you know what, it was 100% my fault. It's a fact, but I have sorrow in my heart for it, even as a saved sinner. See, that sorrow for sin starts at salvation and continues throughout your life as a Christian. But the point is, is when you stand up there, I can't blame this body of flesh. I can't blame the lost world. I can't blame brothers and sisters in Christ. I can't blame God. What you gain and what you lose is 100% your on you. What you lose is your fault. No one else's. That's why this warning in this study is, is, is be trying to push this hardcore. What you gain and what you lose is on you. Time is running short. We could be caught up any day now. One of the most dangerous things a, a man in ministry can do, even if it seems well, like it, meaningful and everything, the worst thing a, bro, a brother in Christ can do in ministry is do a teaching promoting that the catching away is out in the future. It's the worst thing a brother in Christ can do. Why? Because it gets people to take their eyes off Jesus Christ. Right? He can come back any day now. It might look like, oh, maybe in the future... We're supposed to be living every day like Jesus Christ could come back today. And He could. Almost every argument that says, hey, we might be here for a few more years because it'll take a while for this. I can disprove it. The temple, it's going to take several, several years. They can have that temple up and built in a few months. Put on all the equipment in there within a few months, six months tops. Yeah. Uh, well, the Jews haven't really gone back there. They can have th aircraft carriers, C-130s, that they do a big, oh, I forgot what it's called, but it's like a big movement where the Jews are going back to, the, here in America are going back to Israel. They get tired of America. America's falling apart, which it is, and everything just gets so bad that that's God's way of helping them get, their, get back home. Okay? There's a lot of things that, well, this won't happen. For, it could happen overnight. It's so easy to say it can happen overnight. We can get called away this very instant while I'm doing this study. That's how you're supposed to live your life every day. Jesus could come back today. I better get. I need to get busy for the Lord. Working with your hands, doing good things. Prayer. Reading. Praying for the brethren. Being there for one another. Helping one another out. But once again, that's why it states it's your salvation. That's why I say there's a distinction here. It's not talking about eternal salvation. That belongs to the Lord. It's His salvation. He saved me. It belongs to Him. I belong to Him. But when it says your salvation, that's why. What you lose and what you gain is on you. Nobody else. Turn to Mark 4.18. And this is what God put on my heart. The reason we read 2 Timothy 3.16 is because this is for instruction in righteousness. Mark 4.18 says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, the written word, and the, or the spoken word. Back then there was spoken word, but today it's the written word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things enter in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. Now, these three things are the biggest motivator to keep people, that motivate people's flesh, to keep them saying, hey, get them to choose the world over Jesus Christ, to prevent them from getting saved. I hate using the word prevent because nothing really prevents them. It's their choice. What it is, is it, it's like a dangling candy or something. Like a, they always say it like a carrot in front of them. It gets them to choose the world over Jesus Christ. Okay? Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, the flesh, lust of other things, the flesh, the way of the world is contrary to the Bible, and it's very fleshly. It appeals to the flesh. Okay. 
but for instruction in righteousness for the brethren, because it studies for saved sinners. If you're lost, you need to go to the salvation message that I have up on the channel. Okay? You need to get saved. If you're saved, this is who this is addressed to. For instruction in righteousness, these same three things that we're talking about here can really mess you up as a Christian and make you make the Word of God unfruitful in your life. I mean, it all sums up to this stuff. You listen to uh, Paul, how he has to deal with the Corinthians. Lust of other things. They're so fleshly and carnal. Some of them aren't even saved. He doubts their salvation. So would I, according to Scripture. You get to Galatians, cares of this world. Oh, they're telling me that I have to, you know, keep... These people are coming in that I want to be a part of, and they're telling me I have to keep the law in order to be saved, and, and this and that. And then he's trying to talk to people in ministry like Timothy, saying, hey, be careful, don't fall into the deceitfulness of riches. Okay? He's having to deal with these three things, even among professing Christians. And he believes some of them are saved. I believe some of them are saved. He believes some of them are lost. It's called like false brethren. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You know, if any man be called a brother, he doubts their salvation. But he believes some of them are saved or else he wouldn't be preaching to them. If they're all lost, he'd go just straight back to the uh, gospel and that's it. And he did. <laughs> In Corinthians, he had to... First Corinthians 15, he had to go back to the gospel to preach to him, saying, Hey, don't you remember the gospel? The true gospel? Someone's coming in and getting you to believe in a, another Jesus, another gospel, getting you to receive another spirit that he talks about there. That's me going off on that side a little bit. But remember, this is for instruction righteousness, to help you, brother and sister Christ, to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, so when you get up to that judgment seat of Christ, it's just not all wood, hay, and stubble. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the meat of the study, the deceitfulness of riches. Turn to 1 Timothy 6.3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, King James Bible, for English-speaking people, God's perfect written word, and the doctrine which is according to godliness. People who go against this book. This book teaches the Godhead, but they want to promote the Trinity. It's not in the book. Okay? Uh, the true plan of salvation is you've got to come to God broken in a repentant state, having godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. Not, I'm sorry for the consequences, I don't want to go to hell, so I'm just going to say I believe so I can have a free ticket, like a free pass to sin, so I can go to heaven and continue in my sin all I want. No, you're supposed to have sorrow. If you're sorry for something, you don't want to do it anymore. You're sorry for doing it. If you've hurt somebody and say, I'm sorry for hurting you, are you is your heartfelt contention is, I'm just going to hurt him again, I'm going to hurt him again, I want to hurt him again. No, you don't want to hurt him again, and you're sorry for hurting him. That's the whole point of repentance, okay? They take this book and they pervert this book. They pervert the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. For someone who's saved, that's salvation. For someone who's saved, the second salvation, they like to take this book and they like to pervert it. What does the Bible say? Abstain from all appearance of evil. What do the new perversions say? Certain kinds of evil. Not all. They take out the all Abstain from all appearance of evil, just certain kinds of evil. So then, once again, you get to be, you can be as gods, knowing good and evil. You get to decide what kinds of evil can be in your presence and what kind can't. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's being perverted. We stand for the Godhead, the true Jesus Christ. The biggest thing being perverted by these Bible versions is they're promoting an antichrist Jesus. They tear the Jesus of the King James Bible down. He's not fully God, and they make a mockery out of him. He's not fully God. Okay, What's going on with these people? What happens when you see people that do this? Verse 4, he is proud knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. Remember, 
when the fruit of this book stops working because you are falling for those three things that we mentioned, deceit, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things, when this stops working in your life, it becomes your own intellect that you're relying on. Men of corrupt minds, you start failing the Lord. You start backpedaling. Okay. And destitute of the truth. You won't have the truth because this isn't working in you. I've seen people make a mess of the Bible when they start falling away. Some of their teachings, some of the brethren out there that I, I love, I believe they're saved. But some of their teachings lately, it's been, it hasn't been lining up with the scriptures. Why is that? Because this isn't being fruitful in their lives because they're being distracted by those three things. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things. The flesh. And that's to the tr truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. That's the hardest thing to do is having to withdraw yourself from people that are falling away. Great ministries, but there comes a point in their ministry that you have to say from that point on, I can't support them because I can support the old, I can't support the new, he's, he's falling away. Okay, I've seen this in a lot of people. I can't support uh, David Daniels at uh, Chick Publications anymore. I can't support ex-Catholics for Christ anymore. What happened at some point? They might have always been over there and I'm just blind because sometimes I don't see, I don't see everything and I'm not the final authority in all things this is God's perfect written word but you got people that you have to withdraw yourself from ministry wise but you also got brethren we've already done a study on this when it comes to sin if they're in wicked sin and they refuse to give up that sin they're to be treated as a heathen and a publican a heathen's a lost person they might be saved but you got to treat them as a lost person okay Turn to Acts 5.38. Gain, supposing that gain is godliness. What does Acts 5.38 say? And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. Say, so, well, what does that have to do with that, what we're talking about there? That gain is godliness. You'll have people sit out there, especially these um, prosperity gospel people and these Babel buildings and everything, and they're like, um, we're very blessed. Look at what we have and all the income and the money and the wealth. We're so blessed, so we got to be godly. we got to be doing something right because we're blessed. And then they'll try to quote that, misuse that verse. Okay? Be careful of those people. Just because you've got a lot of wealth doesn't mean you're doing right. I mean, come on, brother, sister Christ, we all know this looking at the world. Uh, you've got people that are millionaires and billionaires. Um, does that mean that they're being so blessed by God and they've got to be doing right by God? Uh, no, that's not the standard. Okay, so let them alone. If the, if the work, if this counsel, this work be of men, it'll come to naught. Work. That's the key word there, brother, sister. This is a whole other study, but that's the key word there, work. If you look at these Babel buildings, they're always conforming to the world. They're always changing. We've got to compromise the gospel. We've got to change the gospel again. That's why I can't, uh, I can't uh, promote or support David Daniels at Chick Publications because they've put out so many gospel tracts trying to appeal to the world and changing to the way of the world, they've compromised the gospel. They got gospel tracts, which is easy prayerism. They got gospel tracts that don't even mention repentance. It's easy believism. They've got gospel tracts that do mention repentance. They've got gospel tracts that uh, teach childhood conversion. They got gospel tracts that they're drawing the image of the Godhead, which is forbidden in Scripture. What's going on? The work changes. They keep changing to conform to this world. If this work be of men, it'll come to naught. It's of men. Well, we have contemporary Christian music. Now we have to go to the worldly music, and we have to keep changing the styles of so-called worship music to whatever's popular that day, you know, in that time period. All right? We gotta change the look of the building, to make it more hip, you know. We gotta do a little uh, coffee stand where you get espressos, and we got. It's always changing. They compromise the gospel. They change Bibles a lot. These Bible perversionists, they'll go from one Bible to another Bible. Okay, Buildings will split. 
so on and so forth. But they're still making money. They're still blessed. Look at this big building. Look at me. I'm still blessed. I'm talking about these guys that are, you know, the prosperity doctor, prosperity gospel people. I've got, they're millionaires. $20 million, $20 million jet. Kenneth Copeland, he's an old guy, but there's probably a lot of newer people popping up trying to do the prosperity gospel to get themselves prosperity, give themselves money. But be very careful, supposing that gain is godliness. I've seen some of the brethren slip up and say that. Well, God has really blessed me, so i got to be doing something right. They didn't say it exactly like that, but that's basically what they're saying. Be careful. God has blessed me, absolutely. But that doesn't mean I'm doing 100% right. Okay? I failed the Lord. I struggle with sin to this very day. Okay? I failed the Lord this last winter. Fell back into playing some games. All right? <clears throat> I had to kick it off, and then fell back in again, kick it off. Rain, we get lots of rain here. The winter times are the hardest time. I desperately need prayer from the brethren. I pray to the Lord every day. Summertime, I'm always outside. I try to do my best to stay away from the computer and the internet, and I'm always outside doing work. I'm sitting out on the deck and everything. But the point is, is God has blessed me, and that doesn't mean I'm always doing right. Okay? If you're poor and not, it doesn't look like you're that blessed, doesn't always necessarily mean you're doing wrong. We're going to read that there's times where God does it to make you strong. Okay. But I want to throw that out, out there. Now, as we start this study, because I want to throw that first part out, because you'll see people, oh, gain is godliness. We've got the money. That means we're, we're really godly, because we're rich. And God brought in the money. Okay. Read um, Proverbs about rich men, what happens to rich men in Proverbs. Go ahead and read. <laughs> Do a word study on rich, the word rich. They that be rich fall into a snare. Okay. They that be rich this, that, bad things. Why? Because it's not good to be rich. Look what happened to Solomon. We'll get to Solomon in a little bit. All right. Now, when we start this study, this is the part that got to me. A lot of people who study on this, the deceitfulness of riches, they'll like, well, it's just people like who gamble, and that deceit is that they think that maybe they can win that million dollars someday. Now, what I'm about to say does apply to that, but it's not limited to just that. The truth, when it comes to deceitfulness of riches, and we're going to talk about it, is that the deceit is, is if, about being content, the opposite of being content. The deceitfulness of riches doesn't mean millionaire, billionaire exactly. Because that's what we always use it for. People who want to be millionaires, no. The deceitfulness of riches is this. If I have a little bit more or a lot more, a little bit to a lot more, then I'll be content. That's the deceit, brothers and sisters in Christ. It'll always be the deceit. When you're in that mindset, if I have just a little bit more or a lot more, then I'll be content. Then I'll be happy. You fall into that trap, you'll never be happy. You'll never be content. That's the deceit of riches. Riches, okay? Just a little bit more, and I'll be happy. Just a little bit more. Some people, it might be extreme, like I want a million dollars. It might be extreme for some people, but it goes all the way down to just simply I want a little bit more, and then I'll be happy. Just a little bit more. Okay, I got that. Well, maybe just a little bit more after that, and I'll be content. Maybe just a little bit more after that. See what I'm saying? That's true. That's what the deceit of riches is, and we're going to talk about it in this study. All right? True deceitfulness of riches is the illusion that if I can get more, I will be content. just want to read off my notes exactly. And if I have more, that means I'm doing right. The more I gain, the, the righter I must be. The more godly I, godlier I must be. No. All right. Let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to keep going down 6. You can keep your hand there because we're going to go down this chapter because this is the chapter that's talking to men in ministry, but in construction and righteousness, it's also talking to us, brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Timothy 6.6 6, For godliness with contentment is great gain. There's the word contentment. That's true godliness. You want to know how godly someone is? First of all, it has to line up with here, but someone who's saved, born again, you want to know how godly a saved sinner can be? 
How content are they? But godliness with contentment is great gain. Someone who's truly godly is going to be learned to be content. It says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it certainly we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. There's times that Paul says us, and he's talking about the body of Christ. But for this right here, one of the things I want to point out with it, point out specifically, is that he's writing a letter to a young man in ministry. Paul's in ministry. I point out, I'm not saying I'm Paul, but I'm in ministry. But Paul's in ministry, and he's writing to a man in ministry. Saying, us. This is mainly directed, and a lot of these Babel building people, and they don't like you. They just like to take this and throw it at everybody. All you people, this is for everybody, and you guys have to be content with food and raiment. No, this is directed at men in ministry mainly. Now, for instruction in righteousness, it applies to everybody. But if you're going to make this doctrine, I'm not saying make it hardcore doctrine, but what doctrine means it's specifically pointed somewhere. A specific subject, specific people. Okay, this is pointed and addressed to men in ministry, and it's so serious. How many of us have seen ministries fall because of the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lusts of other things? Some people just drop out, and you don't even hear from them again. Okay, they go the way of the world. They want their riches. They go the way of the world because that's the only way you're going to be able to keep going in that direction. It's going to bottom out. You're going to go up to only a certain point, trying to be godly, getting rich. You know, not, not millionaire, but having more. I just want a little bit more. Of the, it's going to get a rooftop where it's going to stop, and then the only way to go further is if you start compromising. Plain and simple. But this is directed at young men in ministry. Let that sink in. I've seen a lot of ministries where when they're poor, they do their best work. They start getting donations, they start getting a lot of things, and the next thing you know, their, their ministry starts shaking a little bit. It's not as fruitful. Still fruitful, but it's not as fruitful as when they were poor. How many of us have seen that, brothers and sisters of Christ? I used to watch so-and-so, and when he was poor and everything, man, he put out some amazing studies. Now he started getting a lot of things, he started getting distracted by those things, cares of this world. You know, he's, he's just not as fruitful as he used to be. This is Paul telling Timothy that, hey, you're going to have to be content with food and raiment. Okay? If you want to be very successful in ministry, preaching the word, and reaching people, you're going to have to learn to live with being content with food and raiment. Poor. You're going to have to learn with being poor. Right? Let's look up contentment. Remember, this part of this ministry is words have meaning. Uh, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, contentment, content, a resting or satisfaction of mind with disquiet, uh, acquaintance, uh, definition two is gratification. You know, you're content. I'm, I'm happy with what I have. If you get more, praise the Lord. If I don't, I'm not sitting there going, I want, I want, I want, I, I'd like to have this, this would be nice. I've fallen into it. I do fall into it a lot. Okay, I keep looking up uh, for little campers. It used to be because I wanted a little camper to go up and down the coast, you know. Um, but uh, now it's more like I could lose the house, and who knows what happens. Okay, our economy falls, this government falls. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, I just want kind of like a little bit of a backup, but it's not a need. And I look every once in a while, but there for a while I'd look a lot. Every day was looking at all these campers for sale here, all in this in this state, Oregon, then another state. You can go too far, okay? You need to be happy with what you have. That goes for anything. The car that you had. I had an old beat up truck and I lived with it for the longest time until it just kept falling apart to the point where I had to get a new vehicle. And I'm content with one vehicle. I could have kept the old truck. No, I got rid of it. Why? Because it'll become a care of this world that tries to distract me if I'm having to take care of two vehicles when I only need to be taking care of one. All right. uh, content. 
Remember the, uh, the definition of contentment, first one is just the word content. So content, not content, but content. And what's the definition of content with the Webster's 1828 Dictionary? Rest or quietness of the mind in the present condition. Satisfaction which holds the mind in peace. Restraining complaint, opposition, or further desire. I gotta have more. I need more donations. I need this. I need that. I need to get a second job because I want to get this and I want... That's the opposite of content. When you keep saying, I need, I want, I want, I want, I want, and you forget the necessities, food and raiment. And it often implies a moderate degree of happiness, a moderate. It's mainly about peace. Now, I said happiness because it says, hey, there's a moderate amount of happiness, but it's mainly that you're at peace with what you have. That's what content means, brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you content with what God has given you? Turn to Philippians 4.10. Was Paul content? Philippians 4.10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of my hell, care of me, hath flourished again. In other words, that they were going through some hard times so they can only donate a little bit. Or maybe sin or flesh was getting in the way and they, they stopped donating. Whatever the, and they got back on the right track with the Lord, got their hearts right with the Lord. Whatever the reason was, they weren't donating that much money. But it started flourishing again. They started donating more. Wherein ye were also called, but ye lacked opportunity. I'm more with that passage, leaning more that they lacked opportunity. They were poor. They were going through some hard times. Brothers and sisters of Christ, you're going through hard times. God's letting you go through that for a reason. If you can't afford to donate to ministries... Don't be so beaten up because I didn't get to donate. Prayer. Pray for that ministry. Live. Like when I preach the word, like I'm preaching right now, the greatest thing you can do for me is pray for me. And secondly, take what I'm teaching you and keep studying it on your own and living it. Okay, that's the best thing you can do. Donations is when God blesses you with more so you can donate. Okay? But you lacked opportunity. But evidently they lacked opportunity, but now they're doing it again. But here's the key verse, verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want. Paul's getting a little, just a little, Paul's getting a little bit extra than he normally gets. But he's not speaking of want. For I've learned, and we all need to learn this, but especially men in ministry. For I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Let that sink in. At whatsoever state I am, therewith be content. Would we read content, rest, or quietness of mind in the present condition? Paul's like, whether I just have my clothes on my back and I might eat tomorrow, I might not, I'm content. Oh, now I've got a second pair of raiment and I'm getting three meals a day every day for a week. I need to learn to be content. Whatever state the Lord puts me in, I need to be content. Okay? What's the problem that he's warning us about? Going back to Timothy. What's he warning Timothy? Be careful. Don't fall into that trap of, I just need a little bit more. We just need a little bit more. Especially when there's a lot of money being poured in ministries that's not going to the ministry itself. It's all superficial. These battle buildings. Oh, we need a bigger parking lot, we need a little bit more, we need a little bit more, we need this, we need that, we need it more grand, we need it more and more and more. But for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and for me, just as a brother in Christ, we need to be careful about that. We need to be content in whatsoever state God has us in. And when God does bless you with more, Okay, there's a, I'll get into it. There's a lot of things around here that need to be fixed, and I'm slowly trying to fix things up. Okay? There's nothing wrong with saying, okay, my car is falling apart. It's a pile of junk, Lord. The Bible says you're supposed to make your request known to God. If it be your will, Lord, if it be at all possible, can we get a new vehicle that's a lot more reliable? And you leave it to the Lord. But until it happens, you're content with that piece of junk truck <laughs> that I had. You're content. 
you make it work. Right? And then when God comes along and says, okay, here's a better vehicle like he did for me. Here's a better vehicle. Praise the Lord. All right. Now I'm content with that vehicle until it falls apart. It says, now we read there why in every state that I am, therewith be content. Why is this so important? Now we turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Hopefully you kept your hand there. This is why it's so important. You read this all in Proverbs, how being rich causes a lot of problems. But here we see it in 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. That wanting a little bit more, I understand this is talking about somebody who wants to be rich. If you could have anything, the snap of a finger, that temptation's there. Hardcore. Okay? They which fall into temptation. But let's look up the word perdition. I came across this, and sometimes you come across words, I think I know what it means. What does perdition mean? Okay. Uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary says, the, other, the utter loss of the soul or of final happiness in a future state. Future state. So you want, these people want to be happy in their present state. They don't care about their future state. That's the dangers of riches. If I have a little bit more, I have a little bit more. I'm living the dream. How many times have you had, heard brethren slip up and say that? I've always dreamed of living this way or doing this or doing that. And I'm doing it now. They're living the dream. <laughs> okay, Be careful about that. God will bless you sometimes and let you do things that you've always wanted to do. God will bless you sometimes. But if you're not doing it yet, because the doors aren't open, be content with where you are. Okay. But the other lost is all the final happiness in a future state. Their eternity is what matters. Brothers and sisters in Christ, your eternity is what matters. Rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Getting to rule and reign with Jesus Christ because you suffer for Jesus Christ in this life. Part of that suffering is, is you're going to see the world keep pushing you. You want to be like us. You want to be like us. You want to be rich. You want to have money. You want to be able to do whatever you want and do all the sin. And you're sitting there going, I don't want to be a part of that. And because I don't want to be a part of that, that probably means I'm going to be poor. It's almost guaranteed today. Now, don't get me wrong. I'll talk about this a little bit later. But in America, we're not poor. America doesn't really know what poor is yet. It did in the past, the Great Depression. But we haven't seen poor. Oh, we got these homeless people. There's other countries that have seen poor. America hasn't seen poor. They don't know what poor is. Right? Not knowing whether you're going to eat tomorrow. you got all these people that are homeless, and a lot of them choose to be homeless. I'm sorry, I've talked to a lot of them. They choose to be homeless. Anytime they get a leg up and they can get back to working and get a small apartment or something and start living again, they don't want to do it. Life is a lot easier just begging and taking money from people and buying fast food and alcohol and cigarettes and some of them drugs, not all of them, but some of them drugs. Yeah. They choose to be that way. There's a difference when you choose to be that way and you don't have a choice. America doesn't know what poor is. But it's your future state that matters, brothers and sisters in Christ. Future misery or eternal death. When you die in your sins, it's perdition. It's talking about lost people. But what about destruction? There it says drowned men in destruction and perdition. Two things. Men can get drowned in destruction. Men can get drowned in perdition. What about the destruction part? Turn to 1 Corinthians 5.1 when it comes to they that be rich fall into temptation and snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles. People who think that most of the time you're going to see sexual perversion is in rich people. Okay? Hollywood, the music industry, politics, Babel buildings, because they're a business too. Um, the Catholic Church is a big one too. Okay. It's all surrounded by power, money, which is power. That's why the love of money, which we'll get to that verse, the love of money is the root of all evil, because that's how you have power in this world. Uh, next one, that one should have his father's wife. 
and ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, and he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Okay? So it's be taken away from among you. He that hath done this deed. We're going to pause there for a second. You don't have to turn here, but I want to read it. He that done this deed must be taken away from among you. We've done this teaching before, brother and sister Christ, that there is justification to break fellowship with brethren. There's even justification to go as far as you treat them like they're lost. They're probably saved, but the Bible says, and we'll read it right here, that in certain conditions, they are to be treated like they're lost. Okay, we're going to find out why. But what's this thing about to be taken away from among you? Matthew 18, 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Uh, this guy is sleeping with his uh, father's wife. It's a trespass against all the brethren. Not just his father, but all the brethren. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. See, the brethren today have a hard time following this verse. It's so easy to quickly judge and just throw somebody out than to follow the steps that you're supposed to follow. Okay, when I said I couldn't... Uh, support David Daniels, I went to him. Other brethren went to him and said, hey, you're in sin and you're doing wrong. You're compromising the gospel. You're drawing images of, of satanic gods, plural, the Trinity, and the Bible condemns it. He brushed us off like we we're nothing. He ignores scripture. I followed these steps. Same thing with us Catholics for Christ. I went to him and said, hey, Try to in the comment section. Tried to comment with them. Hey, the Trinity is, has no basis in Scripture. Where's capital T Trinity? Is the title for God? They don't care. But I followed this. Do you think I want to break fellowship with these guys? No. But the Bible commands it. That every word may be established. Verse seventeen. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if it, but if he neglect to hear the church. Let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. He's to be put away from you, which we read there in 1 Corinthians 5, 2. Take away, he should have been taken away from among you. You guys know this. He's living in wicked sin. He won't give up his sin. Same thing with Tim. And his video games and his movies. Okay? I confronted him. Oh, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm going to stand by it and justify it. Be as a heathen and a publican. I honestly believe the man's lost. He just likes to play Christian. But, but maybe I'm wrong and he's saved. But it doesn't matter. He's to be treated as a heathen and a publican. He's to be treated as a lost person. You throw him out. Get out of our fellowship. Don't come back until you get this sin out of your life. And repent to God first. And then get that sin out of your life. Okay? That's what it means when it says take him away from among you. You don't fellowship with that kind of man. He's in the fellowship still. Hey, how's it going, guys? Wait a minute. Wasn't he just sleeping with his father's wife? Oh, hey, guys. Isn't, doesn't he promote drinking and getting drunk like it's no big deal? Oh, hello, guys. I, doesn't he play video games and movies and he promotes them and there's no big deal and everything? And the games he plays are wicked. Some of them obviously wicked. Some are just it's to, it's to pull you away from the Lord. Hey guys, how's it going? It's okay, we can fellowship with him. Well, guess what? You're getting out with him. Get out. That's what you got to do, brothers and sisters in Christ. Or they're going to mess you up. And they have. I've seen brethren get messed up by these people. Okay. But I really wanted to push. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Unrighteousness? The acts they're doing is... The opposite of righteousness. Okay. And what communion hath light with darkness? I didn't keep going because we're just talking about someone comes into your fellowship, you believe they're kind, you want to believe they're saved, or you do believe they're saved, but they start getting into sin and they refuse to repent and give up that sin, or promoting things or going against the Bible, you've got to withdraw yourself and treat them as if they're lost. Okay. Proverbs 9 8. Here's the biggest example. I know we're kind of going off on a tangent, but we'll get back to the riches. 
But we're seeing right here, it says, taken away from among you. Okay, because we're talking about destruction. We're going to talk about that. But I want to throw us in there real quick, because God put this on my heart. Proverbs 9, 8. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. How many times have you re reproved somebody, corrected somebody who claims to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, a brethren, a brother or sister in Christ, and they just turn on you like, like a rabid dog? Just go off on you. Who are you to correct me? I might be wrong here, but you're wrong here, 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 here. I've come across those people. I've had people call me holier than thou, only because I'm asking them, you know, to correct them. Okay? I recently, um, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. But let's finish the verse. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. When I get corrected, and I realize I'm wrong, and you get me back on the right track with the Lord and with the brethren, I love you, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a good thing. And it's not if, because there's times people, that I know there's times that people try to correct me, and I go to the scriptures and say, nope, I'm not giving up the Godhead. Oh, no, no, the Trinity's really there. Let me show you. Nope, capital T Trinity isn't there. Sorry, get away from me. There's a difference between that and then someone coming to me saying, hey, you know those video games? You start falling back into video games again. You need to get those video games out of your life. You're right, brother. Thank you for your correction. What happened? But I don't come back with, uh, well, I might be playing video games, but you've done this wrong here, 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 here. Oh, stop correcting me. You're just trying to be holier than thou. You're just trying to be a holier than thou. Oh, you're self-righteous. You're just so frail. Like you never made any mistakes yourself. That's what that verse is talking about. You'll come across those people. Uh, my ex-wife called up and was letting me know that her twin sister died. And I started talking with her and I asked her one question that set her off and she went nuts. And the question I asked was this, how are you doing in those areas? That's all I asked her. How are you doing in those areas? I didn't even have to name the areas. I just said, how are you doing in those areas? Someone who's if someone was to ask me that question because you if you've watched if you haven't watched my testimony please go watch my testimony. The three things that I'm addicted to as a lost man that's carrying over and I'm struggling with now. I didn't struggle with it when I was lost, but the changed life I struggle with it hardcore today. Video games, movies, and TV shows, and porn. God got porn out of my life, but porn's on all three of those and how modest the women are dressed. Porn is in everything. Okay, I gave up cable. If you want to give up cable, you don't want to watch commercials or anything. It's everywhere. Modestly dressed men and women. It's everywhere. Okay? But those three, if you want to say four, four things. But God got porn out of my life that those three things I still struggle with. To this day. So if someone was to ask me, how are you doing in those areas? Not really wanting to, you know, kind of like treading lightly, because that's what I was, treading lightly. <laughs> to not actually bring them up. I'd have been like... Brother, sister, Christ, if it, whoever's asking me, if like, I failed the Lord this winter. I, I got into some games this this winter, and I failed the Lord and I failed the brethren. But I, God's got me back on the right track, got me going strong again for Him and living for Him. Got it out of my life again. I den denied myself, dropped the pride, denied the self. Uh, get it out of my life. Pick up your cross daily, and now God's got me going back at Him. That's the response of someone who's truly saved. You know what response I got from her? She got mad. She called me holier than thou. Said that I'm so self-righteous. And then they do what these... Gosh, I don't want to go off on a tangent. She actually said repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. She's now gone over to the easy believism crowd to justify her sin. Okay, I don't have to go in the areas of her sin, but to justify her sin. And one of her things that she kept saying was, is it's under the blood, it's under the blood. you got to be careful about those people, brothers and sisters of Christ. Just charge it, like a credit card. I'm just going to charge my sin to the cross. I can continue in my sin, and I can live however I want to, and I can just whip Jesus again, whip Jesus again. Oh, there's still some hair in his beard, let's rip out his beard. No sorrow whatsoever for sin. Her sins towards God, it's just... My, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. I can continue in my sin and do whatever I want. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. But she got mad at me. Called me holier than thou. 
Oh, you're just so self-righteous. You're just so self-righteous. What did that say in Proverbs 9 8? Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. I wasn't reproving her. I just simply asked, how are you doing there? I had to hang up on her. That's how bad she got. Out of control, just flipping out. I had to hang up on her. Probably shouldn't have picked up the phone or anything, trying to get in contact with her or nothing. Right? I know how much her twin sister meant to her, but she's still lost. Right? And people say, well, what if she might be saved? Well, there's just a little... Uh, like a molecule of hope that she might be sick. She's still supposed to be treated as a lost person according to the scriptures. She used to be as a heathen man and a publican. A heathen and a publican. Okay. Let's get back to 1 Corinthians 5 3. Remember what we're talking about here perdition, destruction. 1 Timothy 6 9 says, which drown men in destruction and perdition. But what's the destruction for? We're talking. Paul's talking to these people, a man's having his own wife. He's trying to correct them. They, I know some of them had the attitude of fighting them. Oh, you're holier than thou. And you had some that had the attitude of, oh, you're right, I need to get this out of my life. We need to make this correction. We need to fix this, get this sin out of our fellowship. Okay? Might be taken away from among you. But 1 Corinthians 5.3, let's keep going. For verily as absent in body, but present in spirit. Notice this stuff happens when... Godly men that are forceful and say, this is the word of God, this is the stand I'm taking, you guys need to take this stand. When he's there, they, oh yeah, we'll take the stand because he's present. When he's not there, they tend to fall. Okay, But present in spirit, having judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Would we read up there in 1 Timothy 6, 9, But they that be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. It keeps people from getting saved, but it will destroy someone who is saved. And there's times where you have to give someone over to Satan. What that means by is you're not actually saying, Here, Satan! What you're saying is, what the Bible's saying is, is you, Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. If they're starting to go the way of the world, and they want to do things the world's way, and they start turning their back on the Word of God, and you've tried to preach truth to them, and they won't listen, go have at it. You want the world? Go for it. Who's the lowercase g God, lower God of this world? Satan. You give them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And when they become broken again, maybe if they're not saved, they'll truly get saved. That's my prayer for my ex-wife is that she truly gets saved. Okay. If they are saved, the chastening of the Lord. You step back. You know, have you ever had that saying where if someone does something or says something that's so blasphemous, you step back? Why do people do that? They're waiting for the lightning. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. The chastening of the Lord. Uh, the Lord's going to chasten that man. I need to step back. I don't want to be caught up in that. He won't listen. He won't repent. Okay? So you get more for the destruction of the flesh. That's what happens when you start to fall into the temptation of, Riches, exceeding riches. But I always warn brethren about that attitude of, I just want a little bit more. I just want a little bit more. I just want a little bit more. Be very careful with that. Okay, Perdition and destruction. Best way to, to, to distinguish between the two. Perdition, lost. You die in your sins. Perdition. Okay, Destruction can happen in this life. Okay. Lost, saved. Destruction happens to save people. Perdition is lost. You get into that, it destroys you, you die, you go to hell. Because you don't have Jesus Christ. Remember that whole, the whole thing that we're pulling this from, the seed that's sown, it's mainly saying this is why people won't get saved. But for instruction righteousness, this is also what destroys Christians. It destroys the fruitfulness of this book in your life as a Christian. And that's what we're talking about. Turn to 1 Kings. 